Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Today we're going to talk a bit about gRPC and what gRPC is in an API ecosystem. The talk is very short. You'll see the code at the end. I have a QR code and a bit.ly there. So don't worry, you're not missing uh, the actual coding part. So who am I? My name is Irina Skurtu. Still find me under that name on social media. I'm like an actor, still have my maiden name in there. I'm from Romania. I'm an independent consultant, Microsoft MVP. I organize a conference and I blog, not frequently <laughs> lately, unfortunately. But since we're here to talk about gRPC and you're here to listen about me talking um, gRPC, we need to talk a bit about the monolith. We're going to do a short introduction before moving on. So what is the monolith? The monolith is that big chunk of code that, I don't know, I personally used to work with monoliths. I don't know about you. And I must admit that I personally love working with monoliths. It's like everything's in there. You don't need to worry about pretty much anything. You have a, a single code base. <laughs> now we have powerful machines, but 12 years ago when I started coding, it was very nice because I could have gone and grab a coffee while the solution wa <laughs> was building. And it was very nice, very relaxing for a junior developer. Press build, take outside your colleagues, and chit-chat a bit, and then get back, and hopefully the build was done. But uh, now, no jokes aside, the, the life of a developer was very easy when uh, someone worked with monoliths. Uh, and their deal is that they're hard to scale. And we started to approach different uh, architectures. We started to approach things like this, then web forms, then we had ASP MVC that tried to separate a bit the things but we still had one code base. Then we moved along, and we have whatever JS front-end <laughs> applications that communicate with APIs. And in the end, those back-end APIs have different databases also on. Uh, and things started to, to evolve a bit. Now we have one front-end app that talks with several APIs. And those APIs, in the end, might talk with several back-ends you might have different uh, third-party APIs that you uh, integrate downstream. And there is a special need in regards to having something like this. You might need, um, I don't know, you might have a Swift, API, a Swift app that consumes data from .NET, or a .NET that consumes data from a Go one, or a Node.js one, and so on. And you might have something like this, a polyglot environment, because Having this kind of uh, polyglot environments under modern architectures, microservices, uh, it's very nice. It suits the business. It might reduce the costs. You don't have to scale the entire monolith. You scale only the parts of the system that you really need to scale. But that's the short introduction that I made. <laughs> so right on time. We need to talk about gRPC because I have a lot of code. So what gRPC is, in fact? So gRPC is something that tries to mimic client-server request response that we all know. So in HTTP API, we have a client issuing a request towards an API towards a server. And that server receives the request, hopefully, and responds back with whatever response is needed. But under this small architecture, we introduce something in between uh, called the protofile. And basically, this protofile becomes the, the interface between the two entities. And now, in this specific talk, we're going to uh, talk about one scenario, downstream APIs. So HTTP API calling an HTTP API inside your system. We're not talking at all about browsers talking to APIs. That's a specific case. That's a different part of um, gRPC that we won't cover, and it deserves a special talk. So gRPC is contract-based. Uh, you will have no code references, as I'll show you. So it won't need you to add references to packages um, that um, are in your system. You won't have Nugget packages or HTTP clients packed and delivered under different um, parts of your system. Because now if you want to use something like a library, you need to right-click, add code reference, reference that specific library. With gRPC, that doesn't need to happen. You, I will show you, you just need to edit something. It uses HTTP 2 under the hood. 
So inherently, it's faster because it uses a newer version of HTTP protocol. And it uses also protobuf serialization, which ends up giving you a smaller payload than HTTP 1, for example, and JSON serialization. And also, it's available in many languages. We in .NET got it, I don't know, in 2019, if I'm not mistaken. It was received as the first class citizen. And another thing that does it very well is it does culture generation for us without us needing an external tool to run and to obtain um, C-sharp code. So this is the int gRPC introduction. Let's have a look at the proto file. So the proto file, it's something that Google made because it started as being Google's stubby internal project in 2005, I think. And then they evolved it and they open sourced it. So basically, you need to tell what's the syntax of the proto file. I'm going to try and get here. No, I'm not <laughs> going to try it because I'm not going to do it well because I'm not seeing there. Um, you need to specify what's the package that will be generated, uh, the namespace. And afterwards, uh, you will need to specify what are the operations that you want to expose with your gRPC service. Uh, and now, if you ever worked with SOAP services, WCF, Whistle, yeah. Uh, this might, in a way, be familiar. Because what you're doing is exposing operations towards the external world or your system. And you need to define the services. You need to say, hey, I need to expose an RPC operation called Compute Fibonacci that has an input called requested number in here. And re that returns the Fibonacci output as a result. And for each of these input as the parameter and the return part, you'll need to specify the exact type. Well, in proto language, these types are not uh, C-sharp classes. They get transformed to C-sharp classes, but we use the term message. And this message is nothing more than a, um, a series of properties that you add in there of a specific type that is specific to proto language and syntax. And for example, if we look at the requested number, you have an in32 number equals one. Uh, the name of the property that will be generated in C sharp is number, but equal one, it's not an assignment, is the order of that field in the, the byte stream, since it does binary serialization. And the same happens with the Fibonacci result type. So now if in C-sharp, we can have methods that have no input parameters. In here, in gRPC context, we can have that. We can have messages that have an empty body, but you'll need to specify the, the, empty, the empty body as an input. So uh, pretty much this is how everything works, what you need to define to replace your code references. Uh, and having this kind of... Uh, protocol uh, proto file, you basically take this, it's your interface definition language, IDL, it's like an interface in C-sharp, and you said, hey, I'm exposing this, you can consume that, those. And by consuming, I mean calling them. So one thing that gRPC does very well um, is related to G, uh, gRPC types or modes. You'll find different uh, naming for the same thing. So we have four of them. Uh, and one important thing to note is all four of them happen over one single TCP connection. And that TCP connection is open when you basically try and make calls to that specific gRPC service. And the first one that is worth mentioning is Unary. Unary is something that is, well, we all know, request response. You issue a call, you expect a response server streaming, client streaming, and bi-directional. And we're going to have a little small look of uh, every uh, thing here. So unary. So two parts involved, client and the server, consumer and um, the calling party. What happens is that the client initiates a request always. Even in gRPC, there needs the client, it needs the client to initiate the communication with uh, the service, with the API. So it's not like in SignalR where the server is pushing things without uh, the client wanting to. So 
request issued, request received, and response sent back. So if you want to express something like that in a service definition, it's something as you have seen before. RPC service name computes Fibonacci, one thing in as the parameter, and returns one thing out. The next one, server streaming, uh, it's pretty much similar in terms of the client initiating communication. But this time, the client uh, wants something from the server, and the server will respond to several, several pieces of data over the same connection. So one thing in and several things out as a response. How do you show this? Is by adding the stream keyword towards the part that you want it to be stream. So in our case, it's server. So the output part from the server will have a stream of that type. So several outputs. In client streaming, the things are similar, but the other way around. Still, the client needs to open a communication channel. It will send several things in to the server, and it will receive one thing out. So swap the things, and you'll have a stream of inputs, and you'll have one output. So uh, imagine how, this how cool this would be like, for example, in um, scenarios where you need to collect data from different sensors. OK. so. Uh, Instead of open, if you have 100 sensors that send data, you might have 100 TCP connection. And if those sensors send are sending data very frequently, you'll have 100 sensors or over a multiplier. Every time opening a new TCP connection, every time a new TCP connection. With gRPC, this thing might change in terms of you will open 100 TCP connections and over each of those connections, you can send several pieces of data. And it's very important. You basically, you, you mainstream, <laughs> you streamline everything, right? So um, you cut your complexity process with a multiplying factor. So, or uploading data. I don't know, scenarios where you upload data. How cool would it be to upload uh, over a single TCP connection several chunks of data and wait in? wait for them to be received and so on. So it's super performant, and I emphasize that this happens over a single TCP connection. So no new one. So when you issue a HTTP client request, the traditional way, you open a connection, get a response, open another connection, get a response, and so on and so forth. With this thing, open a connection and just travel data over it. And it's super fine. And the last part is around bidirectional. Streaming, which is a combination of the previous two. Still, the client opens the connection, uh, sends several things in, and it will receive several things out. How do you write this if you want to ex this to be exposed? Well, by adding the stream keyword to the input and to the output. And pretty much, this is it. And the next thing that you'll need to do is actually give an implementation for this. And let's have a look at some code. Waiting for a bit. I counted six seconds. OK, I'm, I'm there. So uh, first thing that I want to show you is I'm going to open a new Visual Studio. And I'm going to show you how a, a project looks. Wha and I'm going to get back to Visual Studio when it opens. So you'll get the project that comes installed as a template. It, it has a few things that you're already familiar with. Uh, programs, yes, app settings, JSON, um, and pretty much that's it. And you have no controllers because we have no controller co concept in gRPC, but you'll have a protos file and a services one that gets um, already populated. So this is opened, uh, and what you need to do is, for example, create a new project, search for the template called gRPC, gRPC service, give it a name. Uh, Net7 preview, it's fine at this moment. I didn't want to risk everything like uh, upgrading to .NET 7 since last night. So this is how a solution, an empty one, looks like. You have the proto files that has a method defined 
I hope it's visible to the back of the room. RPC method called say hello gets a hello request in, returns a hello reply, and so on. And the service that actually gives the logic for it. So the implementation service is something that inherits from here. Uh, this part is auto-generated because I told you gRPC does code generation out of the box. It basically generates a code base for you that and some thingies that you can override in order to give the actual logic that mattered for you in your business. So if I'm going to F12 in it, uh, I'm going to show you that this thing is strangely looking, but it has <laughs> the, um, the thing that, that it needs for us. Greater base, it's an abstract partial class, greater base, that gives us basically the possibility of doing this public override, the name. And one thing that I want to show you is uh, even if you're uh, defining your operations as being one thing in, one input, when you override and give the actual implementation, you'll have this context. It's the two or, or the, second or the second or the third parameter in this, these methods. Uh, that contain the actual context. This is similar to HTTP context that we know from APIs or MVC. But don't be confused. This is the actual gRPC call. So if you have clients uh, streaming or server streaming, so uh, one connection with several things traveling over, this gives you access to those small things from where you can extract, for example, uh, claims or things like uh, authorization or things like that. And one thing that I really need to show you is whenever you, let's say you want to uh, add a new proto file, you need to edit the project file and to include something like this. Uh, it's an item group where you can point the proto file. And this proto file doesn't need to be in the same solution. It can be somewhere over the network as long as the, this specific solution has access to it. You need to make it discoverable somehow and need to make sure that the project that accesses th this proto file uh, are actually accessing it. And you need to add this, gRPC services of type server, if you m want to make that specific project a server project. Otherwise, I'm going to show you how you can, in a similar manner, create a client that consumes a gRPC service. OK? So what else to, to show here? It's in programs, yes. Add the middleware, add gRPC. And very important thing, don't do like I did a few days ago uh, with a demo. You need to expose your gRPC service. So if you have different proto files, every single service will need to show up in here just to make it discoverable. And pretty much build the project up and done, and you're already with it. So one thing that I need to show you is actual implementation besides the project template. Uh, I have the grid proto file that implements the all four methods, because I also need to demo you those. So say hello, I kept it under the same pattern. Say hello, server stream, client stream, and bidirectional, which means I have four exposed operations that I, w I can call right now. And what I have is a request. I named it request. Maybe not. Uh, I wasn't very inspired to do that, just because I wanted you to look at it as being the actual request that travels over the network. So this request thingy has a field name content value, and the response has a field name message. So these two will be transformed in actual C sharp classes. Let's have a look at the implementation part. Greater service, what it does. So say hello method gets a request in. And from that request and server call context, you can extract things like getting the current context. You can extract like um, a client certificate from the HTTP connection. So from this uh, server call context, you can access either the gRPC context or the upper one that's the actual HTTP context that we're familiar with. You can add certificate. You can extract things from there. You can add header to the main, uh, main request, or request or not. There are a ton of things that you can do from here. OK, so this is the service. One thing to note is that it's like an API. So if you want to consume things from it, you need it to be up and running. 
So it's not like you're using messages and eventually you will consume those messages. Uh, right now, you need the service to be up. So um, this is the server, and I'm going to show you that I have four console apps. Nothing fancy. Console app. Console app with Zoom. Doesn't want to. Why? No, it wants to. So uh, for the unary type, server streaming, client streaming, and bi-direction. These two are clients and are nothing more than console apps. And if I edit the project files, you'll see that I simply included packages, uh, gRPC, ASP.NET Core, that version, and net client. Um, these are not mandatory. Uh, you can either use this one or this one. I just added both to try a different way of calling it. I'm going to show you right away. And what, one thing that I did here is I wanted to say, hey, this client uses the proto file that comes from the server this here. So that's the path on the disk that I wanted to point. But I might as well point it to D or F drive. It's all the same as long as it has access to it. And this time, unlike the server part, I marked it as being a client. So m by marking this as being a client, it will allow you to actually make gRPC requests. And how I did that? Well, very cool, because it's so similar with HTTP clients that we, I'm assuming that everyone used at least once in <laughs> the developer life. So um, gRPC does one thing. Uh, it works with a concept called channels. And the channel is basically a small wire over a TCP connection that gets you data from the server. And you need to specify where it can find your particular server that you need to call. And you can pass things like credentials, claims, certificates, something like that in there. But I'm going to go with insecure. It's fine. Um, and once you did that, you need to create a client and pass that channel in. So one thing that is super important is I didn't create the, cl the, the client. It's auto-generated. It's for us to use. So it's in generated by the actual gRPC thingy. So once you pass the, ch uh, the channel to this uh, specific client, you can do that. Say, hey, I have a client. I need to call one of the methods. And by calling one of the methods, uh, you need to pass the inputs. As I mentioned, the inputs need to be passed. You cannot have void in there and pass nothing. But if I'm putting a dot here, you'll see that it has all the methods that I exposed in the gRPC part and there I also implemented bidirectional, client stream, say hello, and the four ones that come with C sharp classes to string and so on. So um, this being said, let's demo to see how it works. So I have a server here that I'm going to .NET run. Fingers crossed for it to actually run. It happened before. Not I pray to the demo god, so we're fine. Um, and I have the unaries, the client, the console app. So left-hand side, the server waiting, up and running. Right-hand side, the unary client that will get data. And what this will do, if it runs, is to send something, so a request, and to get something, a response. So what it sends is sending ORI dev, and it gets back a response called hello back with this value from localhost 5000 server. What happened on the server side is that it received a request of type gRPC on greet greeter say hello method. And what I want you to note in here is that it works on HTTP 2, so because this is a default one. And uh, by the way, this is already up and running for HTTP 3. You can tweak some things and make it work with HTTP 3. But uh, I don't know about you guys, but well, uh, it's hard for me to keep up with HTTP 2 everything, and now they're talking about HTTP 3. So <laughs> I don't know. Things are moving very fast. Um, HTTP 2, and it's a post request, even though I got things from the server. So everything with, uh, with uh, gRPC is post, even though it might look that, well, you're doing get requests or update th uh, things, so put deletes and so on. No, you're actually calling code, code, 
in a developer friendly mode and every single time you're doing a post request. So this might be a showstopper for you in specific cases. And what things there to mention here? Application gRPC as a, as a, a MIME type, 200 OK. And this 200 OK is specific to the TCP connection, the upper, the upper level. Uh, and it took that amount of time. Cool. Uh, gRPC unary, very easy. Let's see the other ones. Let's go with the server streaming. And I'm going to .NET run it. You see the server is sending things to the client. Uh, the, the scenario here is that I have a for loop with an I that gets increased and gets sent here. It's a loop just to see here, this, uh, this uh, these values. So server sent things to the client server streaming. The second example, and I also need to show you some code in here. So server streaming, uh, how it's done. So again, create the channel, pass the address and the port if it's the case, have the client, call the client, and just simply call the method. Server stream, new request, it's empty in there. I don't need to send anything else. And I'm going to wait for each response to come from the server and write it to the console. That's the only thing. Uh, the thing that might seem tricky is this thing. It's that from the call, you're reading the response string and just waiting for it to finish. On the server part, that's also important to show. Server streaming, server streaming. Say hello, done with it, server stream. This is the scenario that I've complicated. It's a for loop going to this value and sending an I to the console to for you to see it work. Back to the demo. So server streaming. Now let's see how the client stream streams things. Is the other way around. So writing things on the server side. So the server gots, uh, gets requests with content value and a similar I in there. And one thing to note is the same HTTP2 post request, nothing changes in there, only the, the behavior. And the last part is bidirectional. Server still waits, up and running, waits. And what it does is to send an I that goes to, to 10 and receives back what it was sent. Don't be fooled. It's, this happens over a single TCP connection, but the order of the message is not guaranteed. It happens to be here, but it's not guaranteed. So um, it's up to you how you, you handle this, these things. Cool. Um, what else should I show you? Well. I need to show some things related to client stream. You'll see that one, one of the parameters are um, a request stream. So this is how you override the things that are basically uh, auto-generated for us. And you simply move next, and you write things, and you access the current thingy that gets in. Okay, So in order for you to write it. And bidirectional is a combination of the, the previous two. OK, let's see. Uh, back to the slides. Because I need to emphasize a few things. I have 10 more, ten more minutes. This takes a while. So um, there are some gRPC internals that you might look after. For example, stat status codes. We all know the 64 status codes. 404, 200, OK, 201. We are not necessarily using them, but we know that those exist. Well, when it comes to uh, actual gRPC, status codes are not status codes. Status codes are actually RPC exceptions of a specific type that you'll need to filter whenever a gRPC exception is, is called. Think about this. Um, I'm going to show you in the co code right away. You have a top-level thing, TCP connection, that has 200 OKs and stuff like that. And inside it, you need to make sure that every bit that travels, it's successful or not. And because how HTTP2 is made, you basically have no way of doing that. And they came up with a thing on top of it uh, that is called response trailers, uh, exceptions. And you need to say, hey, if 
uh, in that a lot of time you get no answer, then kill the, uh, the actual request or, or things like that. So let's have a look at it because it's easier for me to, to show you. So server streaming in here. And now you can see it. So in server streaming, the server, uh, the server sends things to the client. And if things happen, for example, catch an ex uh, RPC exception when status code is one thing. And this status code is an enum that is specific to gRPC. And you'll see there, there are things like aborted, already exist, canceled, data loss, invalid argument, not found, failed precondition. But they're not the traditional status code ones. They might be similar, for example, this one. Uh, OK, out of range, permission denied, and so on. But they're not the same thing. Another thing that you need to look after is related to request headers and response headers. Because in gRPC, we have no such thing. But we can have additional information that travel in there. These are called response trailers or request trailers. For example, over a single gRPC request, you could do something like that, hey, get trailers, and access, it's a key value, it's a dictionary in there. And you can access uh, headers, but these headers are not specific to, to HTTP, as we all know. It's specific to gRPC, one level below. And you can access those by, uh, by simply just accessing the key uh, here. And how you add those, for example, uh, we're adding here in the response. You'll need to create a, a small thingy called metadata entry, that simple key value. You add in there, you stick it to the um, actual gRPC, and you actually add it to the response trailer part, and that's it. You have your header. And the same happens also with the, um, the response and the request. So similar things, extra information to be added. OK, let's see. Another thing that I'm not going to switch this uh, because it takes quite a while to, to refresh it. You also can tweak some more things. For example, whenever you're adding the middleware, you can set, for example, the compression level for all the things um, gRPC related. You can have a like compression uh, level optimal, or you can have the maximum message size for your gRPC request. You can tweak those. You can compute those just uh, as you would do with uh, Web API or MVC or so on. And also, uh, you can add a compression algorithm. You can specify which compression algorithm to use. And if you don't like what you have, you might <laughs> create your own or just add things in there. You can tweak these, so deep down some, uh, some things. Um, also, I need to mention a few things that gRPC should do awesome starting .next, uh, .next, uh, 6. Now we're .NET 7, so this still work. Uh, one thing that I also demo uh, is client-side load balancing. It's basically you having uh, an API up and running and clients connecting to that API. And the clients will balance themselves. And it's a cool thing because this way you won't need an additional tool to do that. So um, when configuring this part, you can configure it as being static when you, have, when you know the, the, the addresses uh, or by DNS. So, and you also can have policies like pick first that is available or round robin. Or if you want, you can implement your own resol a resolver. Cool. Let me show you the actual thing in the working. Server, one instance of the server up and running. And I also need to, ser uh, to run another one. And of course, since I need to server instances, I'm going to run it on a different port, right? So server 2 and server 1 up and running and expecting requests. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run another console app, another client. And if things go well, you will see either one or the second server 
as being the one that served my request. Fingers crossed, I'm going to run it several times. OK, so I got hello back with already dev value from localhost port 5002. Fingers crossed from the second part. Yay, it worked from the first time. OK, so localhost 5000 and localhost 5002. And this is very cool because it's basically one client that balances <laughs> itself, uh, trying to connect to the ports and the server that are available. Think about how valuable this is whenever you have, I don't know, Kubernetes pods or whatever running in there, trying by themselves and connect to different things. Um, how this is actually implemented. You can see your code. You can get it at the end. So uh, this is not I'm going to talk. Client-side load balancing. So basically, you need to conf um, to say, hey, um, I have a static resolver factory. I have two balancer addresses. It's localhost, this port, and this port, because I know them as localhost. And then uh, you need to register the singleton factory. But in a way, whenever you create the channel, you, you'll need to say, hey, for a local host, uh, I need to use this whenever you connect. I need it to be insecure because I'm not concerned about security anymore. And <laughs> you need to uh, use round robin config. So what's in turn? First and second one, and so on. And Basically, when you create the channel, the channel gets passed to the actual client, and it knows how to balance. Um, this might be strange, but it's nothing more than a configuration and passing some object and registering into the DI uh, mechanism. But in here, instead of load balancing, you can say, uh, what is it? Pick first. Pick first, pick first. Something like pick, pick, said pick. OK, uh, pick first config, pick result. Why? Doesn't show here. See? Preview version. But what's in there? Round robin config, pick first config, or w I don't know, your own config. Three from there, two from there. I don't know, multiply and something like that. You can also do that. Um, and it's done simply by just specifying a few things. You and, and the rest, the call is, looks the same just pass an additional configuration object. Cool. Um, I think I'm right on time, or at least I hope. Um, you'll have this in here. And another thing that uh, it's worth looking, it's called gRPC transcoding. It allows you to also expose the gRPC service that it's supposed to be downstream, internal to your system, as an HTTP API just by adding some things. And it's very powerful. Because now we cannot say, hey, yeah, I need this service consumed internally, but I also need to expose it as an HTTP to be consumed by, I don't know, the browser or whatever, JS. Right? Now you can do that with gRPC transcoding. Uh, so what are the benefits of actually using gRPC on, or considering using gRPC in actual service? Performance versus size. I mean, the, the serialization is different. It's more performant. It's binary, after all. And it ends up, like for the same request, having 80% smaller payload for the same thing, if you actually compare it, which makes it very faster. Transferring data over the wire that is small is way faster. Uh, it uses HTTP2, which does multiplexing and things like that. It's very fast. Um, you won't have connection exhaustion because, well, you uh, try to improve those 100 TCP connections, things in over the single connections, and uh, no more multiplying factors. Um, so in the end, you'll have low network usage. It's perfect for point-to-point -point communication when you have one-to-one -one and you actually know the service that you want to get data from or send data from or update or something like that. It's contract-based, it's faster, it supports different streaming types over a uh, single TCP connection. It can be configured to run with, uh, with HTTP 3, but, well, we cannot <laughs> uh, 
go without also talking about downsides. Temporal coupling, it's one thing that I need to, to emphasize. If you are using gRPC, you'll need the system to be up just like you would do with HTTP API, RESTful API and so on. Uh, you're not using messaging, it's just a different way of transferring data. Uh, it's not human readable, but you have Postman in beta that knows how to handle Postman, um, gRPC requests. It's very nice, very discoverable. You'll need better testing and focus on CI CD. And it does only HTTP POST, which means that you, well, no caching without some additional mechanism uh, to cache things. Um, and you have the single po point of truth that you travel around. So no more add, right click, add reference, and so on but you'll have the profile that you need to make sure that it's accessible from wherever parts of your system. And it's supported in Azure now. <laughs> After two years or three years, it, it works uh, in Azure as app service. So uh, we should know, all know the tools because distributed systems, and no matter the size of them, are all about trade-offs in my opinion. So um, we need to pick the right piece of tech to actually help our business. Thanks for listening. You'll have here uh, bit.ly and a QR code for the source code and the presentation. You'll have more things in there. And uh, feel free to DM me if you have questions about how to run things. Um, you'll see there a lot of code, more than I got to show you. Thank you.